And ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Jose Antonio Vargas. that many people to watch the film. <laughs> I'm seeing it next Sunday at 9 p.m. Eastern and then they're re-airing it on 11 p.m. Eastern. Um, I have to say that the fact that an undocumented person made a film and the fact that it's airing on, you know, CNN on primetime TV on a Sunday when Game, Game of Thrones is completely out. <laughs> I'm very excited about. Um, I have to say that this is not the film that I wanted to make when I started filming three years ago, uh, but in many ways it's the film that I needed to make. Uh, and since I'm in front of immigration lawyers who love Twitter, the handle is at Documented Film. Um, if you go to Documented, the film website, or on Facebook, you'll find that we're also hosting watch parties all across the country next Sunday. Uh, so please feel free to spread that information around. Um, as any documentary filmmaker will tell you, like, you can't really make the film what it cannot be. Like, the film sometimes tells you what it needs to be, and what that needed to be was my mother needed to be in the film. Because in many ways, like, my story doesn't make sense without her in it. But for somebody who hasn't seen her, at that point it was 18 years when we started filming, now it's going to be 21 years this August. It was just really difficult to share that. But what I hope is when you watch it, you will find the universality in the story, right? Not only in your clients, but also in what y'all are fighting for. Um, I've had the privilege in the past three years of getting to know a lot of immigration lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> it's a privilege. Um, one little anecdote about this is before I outed myself in the New York Times, I showed my essay, my coming out essay, which was like 4,000 words long, to about 28 lawyers. All, all but one said, don't publish this. <laughs> and then I remember an hour before we were gonna close the issue in the New York Times, um, one of the lawyers called me, a wonderful woman called me and she said, Jose, I really strongly suggest that you take out the line in the essay in which you say, I'm sorry for breaking laws. You cannot put that in the paper because you can't take it back. And then I remember going to conference rooms so that the editors couldn't hear me and saying, you know, if I don't put that in the essay, then why am I doing this? So I said to her, respectfully and lovingly, I have to do this. And then, the other thing is I've had many of the members of AILA in the past two months when this film has been traveling around the country, many of your members have gone there to, to our theatrical releases across the country, and I've had some AILA lawyers, because I know that they're from AILA because they're usually the ones that are most concerned. <laughs> so they wait for everybody, and then at the very end, pulls me and goes, <laughs> Did you check with anybody? <laughs> no. <laughs> so I guess my last message before I take your questions is this. Ever since I was a kid, I, I knew that there, I knew the law. I knew what it said and what it says. I knew what I can and cannot do. But to survive and to be successful, whatever that means, I just had to concoct a different set of reality for myself. And independent of what the law may say. And I guess my message here is to thank all of you for doing the work that you do, to fight in the way that you're fighting, right? But also to push all of us as we undergo this moral crisis that this country is going through, to be as creative <laughs> and as open as possible, right? 
when I wrote my essay, when I made this film, I must have read Letter, Letter from Birmingham Jail, I don't know, a hundred times at least. Right? An unjust law is no law at all. So, thank you so much again for having us here. And, uh, National President, newly installed uh, National President Leslie Holman has joined us, and Leslie will um, will moderate. And I'm just going to remind Leslie we're going to repeat the question from the floor just so we, we pick it up. Great. Ask me as many uncomfortable questions as you want. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 9 p.m. Eastern time next Sunday, the 29th. It's going to re-air on 11 p.m. So it's going to be back to back. To, to think that at a time when we're talking about prosecutorial discretion and opening up to, to make things better and we're watching, all of a sudden we hear that families are going to be um, detained together and it, it, it is phenomenal, which makes it even more timely because your story really needs to be there. Um, and I, I, I wonder, I, I don't know, I don't know, I, you, you want to say that these things are accidental? Oh no, so we did not plan it this like this. Um, just so you know, CNN did not. Um, and we didn't. CNN, who I must really commend for taking this film. Um, all, I, all I told them was that I wanted this film to air around my favorite American holiday, which is July 4th weekend. So that's why it's airing when it's airing. But yes, the backdrop is quite dramatic and I think telling. How did you finance your film? How, did, how was the film financed? Great question. Um, I'm very new to the nonprofit industrial complex. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know how long it takes for these grants and these foundations to come through. God bless them, but man, it takes forever. If I had waited for grants, I think I would still be filming, and the film would come out in 2019. So, uh, thank, thankfully, I, was, I grew up as a journalist, which meant deadlines always mean a lot to me. Um, I remember, you know, when I outed myself in the New York Times Magazine, I'm like, what do I do now? And then when I didn't hear from anybody, I, I was so totally prepared to hear from the government or to hear from somebody. And then when nothing happened after seven or eight months, I contacted the editor of Time Magazine and I'm like, I want to write a story about why they haven't deported me. <laughs> There's actually a scene in the film when I, when I call ICE myself. And we'll see. Um, but it's funny, but it's kind of not. So then nothing happens. I did not prepare for that nothingness. And I'm like, what do I do now? And so thankfully we have this film that is landing at the right time, right? So thankfully, since I grew up in Silicon Valley, the last thing I did before I outed myself in the New York Times um, was profile Mark Zuckerberg for The New Yorker. I had a writing contract at The New Yorker. So I got to interview practically everybody that mattered in Silicon Valley because of this, because everybody wanted to look good in front of Mark. So everybody wanted to talk to me about Mark. So after I outed myself, this is when you really get to know who your friends are, by the way. So then a couple of people, Sean Parker, to my surprise, the Napster guy, um, emailed me and said, hey, that was really ballsy. Um, how can I help you? And I said, I'm doing a film. And I didn't hear from him. And then he emailed back seven months later. It's like, hey, I want to help you with the film. So he put in a little bit of, like, he put in money. Um, but I actually ended up paying for half of the film myself, which I didn't even know I had that money. <laughs> and as you all probably know, this is what, to, to me, this is what's really interesting. And I couldn't put this in the film because it's happening. You know, we have this really kind of surreal experience where I made a film and then this is still happening, right? The, the very publicness of it. So I actually formed a business. 
Thank God you didn't need H one B. I'm sixteen. Yes. I have 16 immigration lawyers, two of whom said, hey, you can start a business, apply for an LLC. Oh, what's that? I know the lawyers in this room are getting nervous. Okay, are you all nervous? <laughs> okay. So I formed a business and I employed 40 people in making this film. I'm a job creator, yo. <laughs> citizens in making a film about an undocumented person. It's amazing. I was afraid that I was throwing all of that away 
Because I knew the moment I did this, the journalistic community is going to look at me and say, okay, see ya. <laughs> You're not a journalist anymore. You've taken a stance, right? I was really afraid of that. What I was even more afraid of was my family, right? Um, I don't know people here who live in immigrant families, but there's a certain kind of... There's just stuff we don't talk about, <laughs> right? We'd rather... And I'm sure you hear this from your clients all the time, right? The hardest thing to do is, to, the hardest thing for me to do, and you see this somewhat in the film, is to sit all of my family members down and say, okay, this is about to happen. I don't want you to be scared, right? But this is actually good for all of us, right? But more than anything else, I think for me, I felt really privileged, right? And you're looking at the most privileged undocumented immigrant in America. A thousand people get deported every day. What am I doing? I'm talking to you. I made a film. So kind of owning up to that privilege and also figuring out how do I do this in such a way that adds value, that adds to the conversation. In the beginning, a lot of immigration activists were like, why don't you get arrested and do sit-ins? Why don't you tie yourself to... Some of the dreamers actually thought that I wasn't radical enough, that I should be chaining myself to a fence and... That's just not who I am. Maybe it will be what I am later, but right now it's not. When you see my grandmother in the film, you're gonna figure it out. Because all I know is that she's gonna see this, me protesting, and she's gonna have a heart attack. And I just can't do that to her. Um, so I had to do what I know what to do. I'm a writer, I'm a filmmaker. That I know how to do, right? So I felt empowered in that way, but if I could, I have a lot of undocumented people approaching me on Facebook, anonymously, saying how guilty they feel that they can't do what I'm doing. As somebody who's come out of the closet twice, and I'm not coming out of any more closets, <laughs> I don't believe in pushing people out of closets. I mean, you make that decision for yourself. Right? There came a point for me where it was either I do this for myself, or I just, I just, I just couldn't keep going. And I can't make that decision for someone else. But that's why it's really, as you know, there's still risks of an undocumented person coming out, right? That's why it's up to all of these allies. All of you in this room are allies, right? So what is your responsibility to come out right? and keep fighting for what you're fighting for? For me, at least, that's the question.
So I feel like what the film really does, I think, is provide a sense of kind of, it's okay to talk about it in your own way, right? It's okay to say it out loud. I mean, for me, and you're gonna, you're gonna see this when you see the film. I didn't even really see myself until I saw the film. Just the level of denial and trauma. Next week, I'm really proud. CNN is um, co-hosting um, screening of this film in New York with Psychology Today. And we're going to talk about the great unknown and something that we rarely talk about in the movement, which is mental health. Right? I didn't. I just kind of self-medicated with success when it comes to my depression. I was like, okay, I'm depressed. I was everybody else, so just keep working. You know, that's what I did. And I didn't really realize the toll that that took on me until I saw myself on screen and saw like. And you're looking at somebody who's quote unquote privilege. Right? So I think it's just providing that kind of space is really important. So, give some folks in the back a chance. Yeah, in the way back there on the right. Uh, Jose Antonio, I'm curious how you feel about the framing of uh, through no fault of their own that's often used with regard to dreamers, and and because of course that makes it you know that paints it as well other people are are at fault and therefore they should not have to be considered. I'm curious how you see that. Um, how do I feel about people, including politicians, saying that we shouldn't blame these kids for the mistake of their parents or that or, or it's not their fault? All I can tell you is, without naming certain senators or House members, I've had some really uncomfortable conversations with them. Because, you know, I'm in this thing now, as I have this great privilege of, this country won't deport me, they keep giving me awards. <laughs> it's really, really interesting, I know what's going on, it makes, like, it makes me really uncomfortable. Because I feel like, you're giving, me, you're giving me an award for saying something that I should have said a long time ago. So I feel like I owe it to all these dreamers who were much more courageous when I was a coward all those years because guess what? I was making a lot of money. I always wanted to live in New York. I had a great apartment. Why say anything? Right. So I, it makes me feel weird when that happens. I feel like, <laughs> give me a word if I actually did something tangible, you know, like something I can touch. Um, but to your question, but to your question um, and you'll see it in the film, I, uh, when I found out that I was undocumented and that my grandmother and my mother, and that my grandparents and my mother planned to do this, which is smuggle me here, save up $4,500, which is a lot of money for a family that made more than $8 an hour to get me here. And then I found out that they didn't think it through. They never talked to, they never talked to any, they didn't talk to any lawyers. When I found out kind of what they did, I really resented them. I really blamed them. I was angry at them. I didn't understand why they didn't think it through. Why didn't they ask the right questions? Right? And it wasn't until I was in my early 20s that I started, of course, being more mature and thinking, how, how ungrateful you are, you stupid ass person. <laughs> you know, like, it wasn't until I started waking up to myself that I realized my mother made the ultimate sacrifice. My grandparents did what they thought was the best. So for me to hear these politicians say, do not blame me for the mistake of my mother? No, 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 you're not gonna do that. I blamed her for years and you are not about to do that so you can get elected. Not gonna do it. So I think all of us, making this film, I had three things in a sticky note in the editing room, and one of them was embrace complexity. Embrace complexity, right? Um, I think we should be allowed to do that, even in our political conversations, and we all have to insist on that. May I ask a follow-up? Oh yeah, please, please. <laughs> because when you say the fault of my parents, I mean, does one look at it because I know as a parent, I can't imagine not doing anything I could for my children or my child. And the idea that I wouldn't do that or bring them to me would never be fault. And, and so did you look at that as a fault situation? Or did you lose that? I, I, to me, that is it means even I mean, to me, the, again, we have so framed this issue as a criminality, kind of like some, someone is at fault. 
someone is to blame, right? And we had, I knew that I made the right film. I think it's really, really important that we preach beyond the choir. I didn't make this film, so I made this film so I can go to tea party meetings, so I can have, show the film in front of conservative women, show the film in as many conservative regions as I can, and look them in the eye and have a conversation with them. We had a screening at Miami University uh, where Paul Ryan went to school in Speaker Boehner's district. And afterwards, this woman, she said she was a Republican, she came to the screening, afterwards she was shaking, she said to me, your mother loved you very much. She said, I hope that you guys have reconciled. And I'm like, yes, we have. And yes, she did love me very much. And I hope that when you see these other women on Fox News or MSNBC, when you hear the illegals being talked about, I hope you're thinking the exact same thing. We're in Boston, right? What would have happened to Boston or America if the Irish people did not come here after the potato famine of the 1850s? Whose fault was that? Right. This is why this tragedy about, about the humanitarian crisis happening with these kids. I see these kids and I, I don't know. I see not only future doctors, lawyers, engineers, whatever. I just see future Americans. That's what I see. And we're not having the difficult conversation, right? We're not hearing this in the news. Why are they coming here, right? If you want to talk about fault, what does U.S. foreign policy and U.S. trade agreements have to do with migration patterns? I'm sorry, but I don't know if you're a walking economist magazine where they put some Howard Zinn mixed in, but like, who funded the civil wars in these countries? I was recently in North Carolina, and I said that there's four million Filipinos in America. And this man said to me, why are there so many of you here? Why can't you stay where you are? <laughs> it was late at night, and so I was getting a little, you know. All I could say to him, you know, sir, we are here because you were there. That's why we're here. <laughs> that we should, um, look, all I know is, time is short, <laughs> I believe in deadlines, I believe in insisting on uncomfortable conversations. I frankly think all of us have been too uncomfortable in this country, I mean too comfortable in this country, and that's why we keep having the exact same questions and never really getting at some sort of an answer. So. That's, I think, what this film does. I think this film offers a lot of questions. I don't necessarily answer them because I believe I didn't want to be didactic. I wanted the viewer to kind of leave figuring out what the answers are. But the last thing I want to say is I know you haven't seen the film. I'm a, I'm a strong believer that culture changes politics. Right? Before same-sex marriage became an inevitability, there was Ellen from the Comfort Time magazine. There was Willie Grace. There was Bravo TV. <laughs> right? Culture precedes politics. Unless people don't see these immigrants as criminals, we are not going to change anything. So that's why I made a film. That's why culture matters to us at Define American. And that's why we have to have these conversations. So, thank you very much. Film, and we're in Facebook, so please check it out. Thank you.